we will continue uh, with presentations which I'm sure will all have somewhat of the same dimension of the question of what can governments do if they want to carry out innovations and, and take advantage of the potential of technological change. And where's not is there enough money, but how are we going to get the money that there is and put it onto the right projects at the right time? And the right time because time is money. And if we don't get that right, it becomes too costly. The investor can factor that in too. So to continue, I think it's John who comes next. John Miles, research professor in transitional energy strategies at Cambridge, the University of Cambridge, and um, former member of the board of our. That correct. That's correct. Yes. Thank you. And so there is a kind of a common theme in a number of the presentations around this question of mobility and and uh, and power, which has to come from someplace. Thank you. Otherwise, we violate the laws of thermodynamics. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation. It's a great privilege to be here this afternoon. Um, I have sat here during the morning and the early afternoon and been impressed by the level of intellectual uh, thought that's been put forward. Uh, and so I'm going to have to give you time out for the next 15 minutes and, and be uh, at this little time for uh, perhaps a bit of imagination, a little bit of fun, uh, and, and rather less substance. But I, I would like to provoke your thoughts, and perhaps we can return to the cerebral after I've finished with your thoughts having been provoked perhaps in, in one or two different directions. And uh, I'd like to talk about disruptive pathways, with the emphasis being on the word disruptive. Uh, thinking about the issues that have been pitched to us in today's seminar, they really revolve around thoughts of uh, urban or fears of urban underperformance. And because of the dominance of the urban um, framework in our future society, 50% of people around the world already live in cities, as has been said. Underperformance in our urban uh, context is underperformance across a global context, and that is cause for concern. So I want to think about disruption. Uh, I want to think about underperformance and how we might uh, get away from that underperformance. And what are the levers that might move us away from that uh, underperformance? But before I get too deeply into that, I'd like you just to come with me on a short journey of the imagination and suspend your belief. I want to take you forward in time. I'd like to take you forward in time, I think probably about four hours. Seven o'clock this evening. You've been enjoying canapes. You've had a hard day. Your, your brain is tired. You need to get home. But actually, you would quite like to go up the West End and Oxford Street on your way back to the station to get a few things before you go home. Uh, it might even be your wedding anniversary and you may have to get a present, something like that. So towards the end of the afternoon, when you know that you're going to stay for canapes but not too long, uh, you want to leave perhaps in about 25 minutes time, you will surreptitiously get your hand held out of your pocket and when no one is looking, you'll just doodle up the app and you'll press the buttons for the app so that in 25 minutes time, after you've been polite and you slip down the stairs and you hope no one notices, you'll go out the front door and there will be your transport waiting for you. You'll wave your handheld at the windscreen and the door will open and you'll sit inside and it will know where you want to go but it doesn't have a driver and it will take you through what has become the pedestrianised space between the Isle of Dogs all the way through to the West End, Hyde Park, and a little bit beyond. That whole zone will be pedestrianised, and you'll move in your pod without having to do anything other than do your emails or perhaps watch the news on a video projected inside the pod as it drives itself from here up to, of course, the pedestrianised space which is at Oxford Street and Regent Street. And out you'll get, and you'll go and do your shopping. You'll have moved probably at an average speed of 15 miles an hour, you have been reading the newspaper or looking at the news or doing whatever it is that you fancy, but you won't have been driving. So it will have been a productive 15 or 20 minutes journey. And as you get out of your pod, you don't have to worry about it. It will have dropped you exactly where you want to be, at exactly which shop you want to be, and it will drive itself off to do its job for the next person. Hold that thought. 
I'd like to explore a proposition with you. And the proposition is this, that transport systems and energy systems have been disruptive forces in urban development. Now, I've put energy systems in bracket because as I prepared for this, uh, I fell into the trap of getting too much material and then realizing I only had 15 minutes. And I could speak for days on this subject, so I thought I ought to control myself. So I'm going to speak from here on mostly about transport systems. But I think I could have put together a similar argument for energy systems. But my point is they've been disruptive forces, and the bit that might be a bit contentious is this. Without continued disruption from these quarters, urban performance will disappoint. What I mean by that, it's this. Fundamental to my thinking is that transport and energy systems, they're not enabling forces, as some people, I think, argue. They are actually transformational forces. I'll explain what I mean. And I'll also explain why I think that without continued disruption from these quarters, urban performance will disappoint. So I'd like to give you a little bit of evidence of the first half of my claim, which is a question of transformative power rather than enabling power. A little bit of evidence of the second part of my claim, which is that without continued disruption, uh, not just enabling, but disruption, urban performance will continue to disappoint. And then just to think a little bit at the end, creatively, about what the challenge of the future is and, and, and what might it promise. So first of all, why do I take such a clear position on the debate about enabling versus uh, disrupting? I would argue that transport forces have been truly disruptive in the shaping of our urban forms in, in two key fashions. One is connecting cities which has to do with why is this city here in the first place and why is that other city there? And secondly, once the cities are there, in, in shaping the fabric of those cities. So if I think purely from a UK perspective for a moment, these two images go back to the Industrial Revolution when our, ship, our cities were being shaped in a very fundamental way. And the picture on the left is uh, of Runcorn, the soap works in Runcorn, and it illustrates how the canal actually enabled that soap works to begin to grow and to export its products. And the only reason that that city became, Runcorn became the center of the chemicals and soap business was because of the ability to move the chemicals, both the input and the output chemicals, up and down from Runcorn to other places. So the connection of Runcorn to other places was fundamental to its growth, and without that, it would not have happened. That's a truly disruptive influence, I would argue, not just a, a rather passive enabling influence. And the same of the railways, Stockton and Darlington Railway on the right-hand side, connecting together those cities that were in what was to become an industrial heartland. These were transformative propositions at that time. But the point I'd really like to make to you is this. If somebody came to you 200 years ago when you didn't have anything like a JCB or a tower crane or anything that was mechanical in its nature and said, I want to dig a series of channels across the UK and put water in them so we can float boats up and down them. By the way, they've got to be absolutely horizontal, otherwise the water will run out of them. So across the UK now I'm going to build all of these uh, channels they're going to be absolutely horizontal, because they didn't have locks in the first canals they built. And they're going to do it all by having hundreds and hundreds of people digging and a few rather crude levelling tools. You would have said they were mad. And if somebody else came to you and said, I'm going to build a railway that goes from the east coast to the west coast of America, and what it involves doing is putting down a continuous strip of steel for several thousand miles, you would have thought they were mad. And the point I'm making is that those people had unlimited imagination and unlimited ability to apply themselves to what they believed would make a transformational change. We look back and we're not struck by what they did. <coughs> but to be looking forward at the time, what an extraordinary proposition in both cases, the canals and the railways. And if you research it, how quickly we built the railways out throughout the United <coughs> Kingdom. And it was all done by private enterprise. Extraordinary. And if we come from a slightly different angle now and look at how 
transport has shaped our cities. It shapes our cities in all sorts of ways. It defines the fabric. And you can find lots and lots of examples of this. On the left-hand side, Metroland, which is a whole area of development out to the northwest of London, which is opened up by the extension of the Metropolitan Underground Line. It became their business to build new estates for people to live in. An interesting combined railway and urban um, uh, housing uh, pro program, which actually was paralleled in Hong Kong. It's exactly the way it worked in Hong Kong. They built a railway, they built the residential blocks above the stations. It's one of the few railways in the world which actually pays for itself, but it's because of the residential blocks that it pays for itself, not because of the tickets. But the transport infrastructure shaped the city, defined the fabric, and of course on the right-hand side they're in a different sort of way. That, of course, is Shanghai. Uh, and how about that for a piece of urban fabric? So these things have enormous effects on our, our urban uh, infrastructure. And you might say, well, of course, that's all very well, and you would be right. It is all very well. Here we are. We've got the cities. It's all happened. Uh, why did I make that rather uh, outrageous second part of my uh, proposition, which was that without continued disruption of this sort, we will underperform? Well, and this is only my opinion, it seems to me there is a natural tendency to saturate, and saturate leads, uh, saturation leads to underperformance. Cities work because people come to them. People keep coming to them whilst there's something there to do and something good that can happen to them. Whilst their standard of living can rise by moving to the city, they will move to the city. As a consequence, the city gets fuller and fuller and fuller, and if it doesn't rejuvenate its infrastructure, sooner or later, it will strangulate. And after you go past that point, then people get poorer by coming to the city rather than richer. It's an amateur philosophy, but there are two, I think, uh, aspects to this argument. One is the no way to get there problem, meaning that loads of people want to come into the city, but if you can't get into the city and, you, and you, the city clogs up, then the city will underperform. It just can't happen. And a good example of this, I think, is Mumbai on the right and Shanghai on the left. Those two cities are, have incredible parallels between them. Look at the difference between them. One has, and you can argue it's an imperfect uh, mobility infrastructure, but one has a mobility infrastructure, the other one doesn't. So despite the influx of people into Mumbai, that city underperforms compared to what it might do, with enormous impact on India and India's economy. And in a different sort of way, there's another problem. If it's easier to go somewhere else than the city centre, then people will go there, either because the city centre has become <coughs> clogged up and the roads going elsewhere have become better, so they go elsewhere, out of town shopping centres, things like that, or because they choose to shop on the internet. But the result is the same, that in the city centre, there's no reason to go there anymore. It's actually harder to get there than it is to get to these other places when you take everything into account, so people don't go. So once it becomes easier to go somewhere else for whatever reason, then the city dies. And that picture on the left is Stoke in our own country. Picture on the right, if anybody has not recognized it. No, it's Detroit. As I was researching this piece of work and this little presentation, this struck me. I just showed you Mumbai on the left, and I just showed you Detroit on the right. And that is almost the same photograph, isn't it? That is a dysfunctional city. That's a no one wants to go there problem. Would that have happened if the city hadn't strangulated? Will it happen to Mumbai? Will the city strangulate or will they get rid of that problem and enable it to move? Because fundamentally what I'm saying is that cities that don't move don't work. So when Joseph opened this session, he said at one point, but where is the strategy? These are big issues, 25-year planning periods, billions of pounds. They can't happen overnight. So, so where's the controlling hand? Where is the strategy? And if there is one, it's here. We're all choking to death. We're all getting into this pressure cooker. Global warming is all around us and carbon is the problem. I must say, as a scientist, I find this very unsatisfactory. 
wherever I've dealt with a multivariable system, and wherever people involved with multivariable systems single out one variable and talk about it as the sole cause of everything, they are invariably wrong. So we run a great risk of putting every problem we have <coughs> into one basket, which is the anti-carbon problem. So we need to be very aware of that. But nevertheless, there is a lot of evidence that we need to do something about it. So we need to get rid of the car, particularly if we're thinking of urban. That's what we need to do because it puts out far too much pollution and we've had a few comments on it already. And uh, lots of people have done lots of research and produced pictures like this, which makes it very obvious how much advantage there is in getting out of our car and onto some other form of transport, which enables us to move more freely through the urban fabric. As with most things, it isn't quite as easy as that. Uh, I've become rather sad since I got interested in this subject. I walk down streets and I look at things like buses, taxis, cars and traffic jams. This is the Strand. Uh, this is my own picture. I took it because this was taken at midday a few weeks ago. The Strand was clogged. It was full of buses from nose to tail. Not one of those buses, as far as I could see, had more than four people on it. Not one of those taxis had more than one person in it for the time that I walked down the Strand. The Strand was chock-a-block with empty big vehicles. That says, get out of the bus. So what should we do? Get out of the bus or get out of the car? Actually, more critical analysis is required. If you think a bit more creatively about that picture, why is it that we have to get out of the car in the first place? The answer is because people like cars. So don't fight against that without coming up with something that's better than that because people are not going to wear hair shirts just because we want them to. So you've got to do something better than the car. And what is it that's so good about the car? Well, there are lots of different things that people cite, but I would say a couple of key things are that incredible flexibility. It takes you from your door to wherever you want to go. If you go on the bus, you end up walking at least 200 yards. If you go on the train, maybe more. And spontaneity, you use it when you want it. You don't have to make any plans, you just go when you want to. Spontaneous mobility is a very attractive formula. So why don't we bend our minds to <coughs> providing spontaneous urban mobility rather than banning the car? If, for example, we looked at that picture on the right, we could, if we were clever enough, shift all those cars over to the left and create at least another two lanes. If they could all move more closely to each other, you could probably get 50% increase in capacity on the road. I don't know how else you could get a 50% increase in road capacity. That would be almost for free, and that could be done by intelligent systems. There are all sorts of ways of dealing with this problem, but another thing that would make an enormous difference would be those cars on average carry 1.6 people per vehicle. So if we shrunk the car so that it was 1.6 people size instead of four or five people size, we would get at least another two or even three cars per footprint down there. So we could get big multiples if we had small vehicles moving closely together under closer control. We could get even bigger multiples if we look at the side streets, which aren't really very clear from that photograph. Because of course a lot of city congestion has to do with the primary routes, it doesn't have to do with the secondary routes. If you look at the total area of blacktop in the city, we use an astonishingly small fraction of it. So there's a huge um, resource of blacktop already in our cities that is not actually very well used. I'm getting to a point simply where I'm saying there's enormous capacity in what we already have. We don't necessarily have to build a lot more roads, but what we do have to do is provide something that's better than the car, because it's an endless fight trying to make people take something that's worse than the car. It's the first thing to do. There's another little twist to this, of course. I thought I might provoke you with a few thoughts. These are TFL's records of CO2 emissions by mode of public transport. These are uh, grams of CO2 per passenger kilometre. As you can see, going from 20506 on the left-hand side over to right now, 1213, there's been a constant decline. They've done a good job. The average is the pink bars, the histograms, and that average now of all modes of transport offered by TFL is sitting at 60 grams per passenger kilometre. 
I think TFL is a world-class organisation. Within the constraints that they work, they deliver a fantastic public mobility system, and they have cut the carbon, out, the carbon footprint of that system consistently over the last decade. However, at 60 grams per passenger kilometre, that is more than you have than 1.6 people in a small car. So this is not the least carbon way of moving. If you have four people in a modern small car, you'll be down to 25 grams. Nothing beats that. So think about that when we think about carbon too, because it is not the case that mass transit systems give you the lowest <coughs> carbon footprint. So what we really want, back to where I started, which is why I said hold the thought, what we really want are small vehicles that appear on demand that aren't necessarily owned by people, but are accessed by people, that allow you spontaneous mobility, that can move at will. And just imagine, if you didn't have to come in inside the circle line within London, because vehicles like this were freely available, moving amongst people, and the whole of the rest of the space in London, and indeed other large cities, was <coughs> mixed space now, pedestrianized space with these autonomous vehicles moving freely amongst pedestrianized space, I would put it to you that we would have a lot more mobility in our inner city than we ever will achieve by trying to build much more underground railway or much more bus route or whatever else it is. And my point really here is transformation rather than adapting what we already have. Mild adaptation of what we already have is not going to equip the city for the next 100 or 150 years. What we're looking for are what harps back to the railways, the canals, the sewers, and all those transformational <coughs> things. And just to really pique your interest, whilst I'm involved in that previous exercise, the autonomous pods, I'm not involved in this one, sadly, but everybody will know what this is. This is the Hyperloop, Elon Musk's latest idea. Actually, a truly transformational idea. Here's this tube. You get into a little pod. The pod shoots down the tube at sonic speed, or near sonic speed. Here's the pod, eight people in a pod. This system, if we put this instead of HS2, just for a moment, <laughs> you would get to Birmingham in 15 minutes. City centre to city centre, not having to go to the airport in 15 minutes, that has the ability to transform the whole of the UK into one big city, if you care to look at it that way. It would transform, I would suggest, the economics of the North-South divide. And of course we all laugh because we know it won't happen. But we would have all sat there laughing when they proposed the canals and when they proposed the railways. And of course the thing which kills this is the enormous cost. This would probably cost something in the order of well, I think Musk estimated it would cost £4 billion to connect San Francisco with Los Angeles. So £4 billion is a lot of money. Of course, it costs a lot more than that to build HS2. So this is not unduly expensive. But who's got the ambition to actually do this? So my final question and thought I have to leave with you is this. If London is to compete as a world city on the stage that was described to us a few minutes ago, and indeed all cities are competing with each other on a world basis, they all want to thrive, they're all going to be attracting significant increases in populations, or the successful ones will anyway, I put it to you that tweaks of existing systems are not the answer. We need the continued disruption and the continued unlimited imagination that were given to us by our forefathers. Transformative ideas are required, and they're available. I've illustrated just two. The question is, how do we unleash that potential? As the previous speaker said, and I wish he could have stayed because I would have liked to have asked him, money isn't the problem. Something else is, confidence is. Maybe a hint to all this is, so how did they do it? How did they raise the money for what were at those times enormous projects to lay down the canals, the railways, even the sewers? Huge projects which resulted in enormous public good, but probably were privately financed. Actually, the sewers weren't, but the railways and the canals, I believe, were privately financed. So what gave them the confidence, what gave them the confidence to do it? 
And how do we reposition our formula today to do these new exciting things that are in the wings? Thank you. If you allow me, I'll give you a brief answer for the 19th century. It was a time when 90% of the people rented. They didn't have mortgages, so they bought debt to finance railways, telegraphs, shipping lines, and sometimes they lost their money. I'll take that conversation up with you afterwards. But it's the balance between the mortgages and the, the, other, the other things you can do with your money. That's, Thank that, you. that, was, that was just fine. <laughs>